revival is about to hit House of the Promise. Hang on before you shout. Hang on before you shout because there's more. And he said, and it's going to happen right where you're at. I don't, I hate what talking about this bill. Some of us, well, most of us, I would not be afraid to say all of us, are in a metaphorical wilderness. Come on, somebody. What does the wilderness represent? The wilderness represents transition. And just about all of us are experiencing some type of transition. He wasn't talking about Clanton, Alabama. He was not talking about Chilton County as talking about when he said right where you're at. He was talking about in the middle of transition. Right in the middle of the wilderness. Y'all heard me touch on it a little bit Wednesday night. He said right where you're at, right in the wilderness that you're in, you are going to experience revival. I said, how can it be? How can we have revival in the wilderness? How can I have revival in transition? And he says, because you'll have it because you built it. Do you hear what I'm saying? You'll have revival because you have built revival. Every time we come together, it should be revival. You will have revival because you have built revival. And y'all know, y'all know that's in my spirit. I couldn't get away from it Wednesday night. I didn't even want to talk about it. And I talked about it Wednesday night. Now, I'm going to now give you what the Lord gave me to speak today along those lines. I want to talk just for a little bit this morning on I have all I need right where I'm at. Come on. I have all I need right where I'm at. But I need to tell you something. That doesn't mean you stay where you are. Come on. It just means He's the provider no matter where you are. He's the sustainer no matter where you're at. You can be on an ark full of stinking animals in the middle of a flood and He's still the provider and He's still the sustainer. You can be standing at the... At the at the, uh, on the beach of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army can be breathing down your neck and he is still the provider and he is still the sustainer. Come on, let me talk to you this morning. You can be staring at the light bill Come on. and you can know that he's still the provider and he's still the sustainer. You can get, you can get that bad phone call that you wouldn't want him to get, and you can know that he's still the provider and he's still the sustainer. I've got all I need right where I'm at. If you've got your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 41. And we're going to start reading in verse 17. And it's, a, it's our custom at this church that if you're able, that you stand for the reading of the Word. Isaiah chapter 41. I'm going to start reading in verse 17. This is what it says. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Listen to that. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Aren't you glad we serve a God that will not forsake us? I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water. And the dry land springs of water. He said, I'm going to put something there that ain't never been there before. Any other time, come on somebody, I'm going to stop right there for a minute. Any other time you was in this wilderness, there wasn't no water there. But now the provider's there with you. 
And he says, I'm not going to let you be first. I got to keep reading. Verse 19. I will plant in the wilderness, listen to this, the cedar and the acacia tree. If you're reading uh, King James Version, version it says the shitter tree. The myrtle and the oil tree. I will sit in the desert, the cypress tree, and the pine and the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. When revival hits us in the wilderness church, ain't nobody going to be able to say Pastor Justin built revival. Ain't nobody going to be able to say look at them deacons, they got it going on in House of the Promise. They're not going to be able to say, look at the praise team. They got revival going. They're going to say exactly what Isaiah 41 said. They will say they're going to consider and understand that it is the hand of the Lord that has done this. Dear Heavenly Father, I praise you. I thank you. I worship you. I pray that you continue to have your way in this place this morning. Let your word be fruitful. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can we give him one more hand clap of praise? I'm not going to try. I'm going to try my best not to hold you long. But I do believe that this message needs to go forth. If not, I would have closed service. I'm just going to be honest with you. The Holy Spirit has done spoke. He's done move. And I am very humbled And you need to understand this. I'm very humbled and I'm very nervous to try and follow that up. Amen. So what's been done, what has already taken place and happened is already, it's already happened. There's no way that anything I can say or can do can outweigh or outdo what's already been done. You understand what I'm saying? But he won't let me close. He says the message needs to go forth. So I'm going to let it go forth. Amen. 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 Before we get into this, um, don't forget I've got to uh, have a meeting um, today. All my deacons and my uh, DLT members need to be here today at 3 o'clock. Um, everyone else that is on staff or that wants to be a part, even if you don't serve on staff and you want to be here for this meeting, that's going to take place at 3.30. Some of us are getting sandwich stuff and we're just going to hang out and we're going to eat if you want to go run and get you some sandwich stuff and bring it back so that way you ain't got to run around like a chicken with your head cut off trying to get here by 3. Um, you're more than welcome to come and eat with us. Amen. Come back tonight. I will not be preaching. Destiny's preaching tonight. And she's got a word from the Lord. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 41, he starts off in verse 17 talking about the poor and the needy seeking water, but there being none. There's no water there. That, that's something that we need to understand is that when, when we get into the wilderness, the things that we need or the things that we want or the things that we desire are not there. Um, the joy is not in the wilderness. Raise your hand if you've ever had joy in a wilderness. Praise God. Hallelujah. Nobody. Because what we got to understand is that joy is not in the wilderness. There is no peace in the wilderness. The joy is in God. The peace is in God. Come on somebody, listen to me. And if you ain't got God in the wilderness, you can't have joy in the wilderness. You can't have peace in the wilderness. Somebody asked me one time, they said, man, your whole life is falling apart, yet you still laugh. How is it? Because my, that, that never had my joy. Listen to me. That never had my peace. That never, that never had my mind. And therefore, it couldn't take the joy when it walked out. It couldn't take my peace when it was pulled from me. Come on, somebody. 
Because it's not in the wilderness, but it's in God. So therefore, when the wilderness comes and tries to rob us of those things, He can't take what God only can give. Following me? So, therefore, the first thing we need to realize is the things that we need for revival. And, and I'm not talking about corporate revival. I'm talking about individual yeah. revival. I'm talking about being refreshed. I'm talking about being restored. I'm talking about some of you just getting resurrected. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And what we must realize is the things to do that are not in the wilderness. The wilderness does not have the ability to produce what we need. But the one that lives inside of us does. He has the ability to make water rise up out of a dry ground. He has the ability to put rivers where rivers are not supposed to be. He has the ability. And, and one thing that came to my mind was a message that the Lord had given me to preach not too long ago and I preached it here. And I said, and I talked about stirring it up and how we've got a river on the inside of us. And I love how right here in Isaiah 41 in verse 18, He says, I will make the wilderness a pool of water. Notice he didn't say he was going to stir the pool. He said, I'm just going to put the pool there. And I'm going to see if i got some people that will step out on faith and dare to stir the water. But then he gets into what I really want to talk about. He, he says he plants seven trees. Now I'm going, I'm going to try and teach this. He said he got seven trees that he plants... In the wilderness. Seven of them. Seven is God's number of perfection. That means when something is perfect, that means it lacks nothing. That means if I've got all seven of them, there's nothing left out there that I have to go look for to bring back with me. I've got everything that I need right here where I'm at. Why did he send the water first? Why did he why did he let the pool be placed first and then bring the water? Because God in his infinite wisdom knows that I can place a tree, but there must be something in the wilderness to sustain it. There's got to be something there that the, that the roots can go down and, and find water and bring it in so that life can come into this tree. I can place a tree there, but I've also placed laws of the earth in order. And if there's nothing there for them to draw from, then they're going to die. I gotta put something to sustain them. So he lets water fill the desert. And then he says, after the water came, I planted seven trees. Seven is the number of perfection. But the water makes the eighth thing. And the eighth thing represents a new beginning. It represents a new start. It represents new life. I'm here to tell somebody we're about to have revival in the world. Seven trees. I gotta move. I gotta go. Seven trees. I got seven points. Yeah, I'm gonna be. Lord, they said, somebody go to the fellowship hall, make me a sandwich now. <laughs> seven trees. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through them. Don't worry. The first tree he said was a cedar tree. The cedar tree, the Lord showed me that the Hebrew word, the Hebrew root word means firm. And the cedar tree is known for its firm roots and its resistance to decay. And it's known for its resistance to decay. It's got firm roots. It's got strong roots. And when the, when the, when the land dries up and winter comes, it is resistant to decay. It's known for its longevity. I want to tell somebody, He's going to keep you in the wilderness. If you'll stand firm and you'll stand strong and you won't let the wilderness get in you, but you will be in the wilderness, you will be resistant to decay. Oh, but 
there's more. The second tree that He places, I told you I'm going to try and get through these. The second tree that He places, the New King James Version, what I read to you, it says the Acacia tree. But the King James Version calls it the Shitta tree or a Shittim tree. And what that is, it's the same type of tree that was used. Listen to me. It was the same tree that was used that they went and got the Shittim wood that the Bible that God told Moses to use to build the Ark of the Covenant. He said the Ark of the Covenant's got to be made out of Shittim wood. And then he told them, he said, I want you to build all this furniture and I want you to put it in the tabernacle. But you can't use cedar wood and you can't use gopher wood and you can't use a pine tree. It's got to be shittim. It's got to be shittim wood. And so they used this wood to, to make the Ark of the Covenant and they used this wood to, to make the furniture that goes into the tabernacle. And it was all these things placed together that gave us the temple. And once they had the temple, they could take their sacrifice and they could go into the into the Holy of Holies, lay their sacrifice on the altar. How many of you know if it wasn't for the wood, there wouldn't be an altar? How many of you know if the glory from the Ark of the Covenant wouldn't be in there, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be a Holy of Holies? And he says, it's got to be shit of wood for you to go in there and that's got to be the wood that is all throughout this place. And when you bring your sacrifice and burn it to me, I will forgive Israel of their sins. Well, I done a little bit more study. And I came to find that the acacia tree actually means scourging thorns. It's known for its scourging thorns. Why did it have to be shit of wood to build the Ark of the Covenant? Why did it have to be shit of wood to build the furniture in the tabernacle? Because it means scourging thorns. And when us New Testament, come on somebody, believers hear the term scourging thorns, there's only one thing that we think about. And that's the man named Jesus that went to a cross on Calvary and they scourged him with thorns. They took a crown of thorns and they placed it on his head. Why does the acacia tree have to be in the wilderness? Because I don't know about you, but when I get into the wilderness, the devil tries to make me think I'm in the wilderness because of my sin. He says, you're in the wilderness because you disobeyed God. You're in the wilderness because God has left you and He has forsaken you. But I'm reminded every time I look at the acacia tree that He saved my soul, that He never leaves me, that He never forsakes me, that He's sticking closer than any brother. Oh, I'm reminded every time I look at the acacia tree of the thorns that was placed on his head as a mockery, calling him the king of the Jews. He's not the king of the Jews. He's the king of the universe. The next tree that he placed in the wilderness was the myrtle tree. Now I had to do some digging. Because the only myrtle that I'm familiar with is the crepe myrtle. How many of you know what a crepe myrtle is? Yeah. We know what the crepe myrtle is, right? And we know that in the winter time, the crepe myrtle, just like all the other trees, their leaves begin to change and they die. But as I was digging, I come across a scripture in Isaiah chapter 55. And verse 13. And it read like this. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. And instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. Now you need to know something. Briars represent drought. That's what they represent. They represent drought and dry places. And he said instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord as a name for an everlasting Sign that shall not be cut off. What does that mean? When it's something that's everlasting, that means it never dies. It's everlasting. 
And when he says it shall not be cut off, that means no matter what comes, it can't kill it. So how can it be a crepe myrtle? Listen. And be everlasting. So I had to get away from the Bible. And I had to Google. And I said, I know I'm not crazy, but I Googled it anyway. Is a crepe myrtle an evergreen? And Google did not shock me. Because a crepe myrtle isn't. But there's another myrtle that I didn't know about. And it's called a wax myrtle. Oh, listen to me. And a wax myrtle, unlike the crepe myrtle, has a longer water course root system. Its roots go much deeper than the crepe myrtle. And when winter comes and all the leaves change, the wax myrtle's leaves don't change. Oh, listen to me. When, when the dry seasons come and all the other leaves fall off, the wax myrtle still stands green. Come on. It still stands and it still reminds us that seasons may change. That days may change. That people may change. But He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that I knew on the mountain is the same God in the valley. The same God that I was in revival with is the same God I'm in the wilderness with. Oh, I'm reminded. I am reminded. The Bible says that heaven and earth may pass away, but His Word will stand forever. It doesn't fade away. Your words are like a vapor in the wind. They can be here today and gone tomorrow. You can, I'm going to preach like I feel it. You can make me promises. You can tell me all this stuff that you're going to do and the stuff you ain't going to do. And it might be today and tomorrow you may walk away from your promise. You may not come through for me, but I serve a God that always comes through on His promise. His promises are yes and amen. He said my family would be saved. I'm expecting them to be saved. He said they'd be delivered. I'm expecting them to be delivered. He said I'd never be found begging for bread. And I ain't going to beg for After the myrtle, the Bible tells us the next thing he placed was the oil tree. What is the oil tree? It's an olive tree. But the oil tree is in the wilderness. Why does he place the oil tree in the wilderness? I'm going to slow down because I feel that this is the most important one. Just about anybody in here that's been saved and has studied the symbolism of the Bible knows what the olive represents. They know what the oil represents. The oil represents the anointing. That is not a shocker to most of us. Some of you, it might be the first time you're hearing that the oil represents the anointing. But to most of us, that's not a shocker. If you've spent time in this church, you've heard me talk about the oil. It's like my favorite subject. I love the anointing. Because when I'm in the anointing, things that hurt don't hurt no more. Come on, somebody. When I'm in the anointing, things that usually weigh my mind down vanish. And they no longer are there because I'm under the anointing. Come on. But see, I know that I can't be the only one that when I get in the wilderness, I don't feel anointed. Come on. Am I the only one or do I got some people in here that say, you know what, when I'm in the wilderness, the devil makes sure to tell me that I cannot be used because I am in the wilderness. You can't pray for nobody because you're in the wilderness. You can't minister to nobody. You are in the wilderness. Take a back seat. Sit down. Keep your mouth shut. Quit thinking that God is giving you a word because you're in the wilderness and there is not an anointing in the wilderness. And you want to, you may tell you something, I'm going to shock
up your mind. The devil is right. There ain't an anointing in the wilderness, but there's an anointing on the inside of me. And I'm in the wilderness. So since I'm anointed and I'm in the wilderness, the wilderness is anointed. Uh, uh. David slept with Bathsheba. Come on, listen to me. David killed her husband. Uh, David done some evil things, uh, yet he was still anointed. Uh, Samuel went to Jesse's house, uh, took a horn of oil, poured it on David, and said, you are anointed the next king of Israel. And that day, David did not go to the castle and tell Saul to evacuate the throne. He went back to the wilderness. He went back to tending the sheep. What am I saying? I'm saying I'm anointed and in the wilderness. I'm in the wilderness and I'll still see people healed. I'm in the wilderness. I'll still see people saved. I'll still see people delivered. Just because I'm in the wilderness does not mean that I can't be used. Oh, I'm anointed in the wilderness. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I'm anointed in the wilderness. That wasn't the right neighbor. They won't get down with you. Tell your other neighbor. Find somebody else in your vicinity. Say, I'm anointed and I'm in the wilderness. So, so come on, hang on a second. There's one more thing. Look at the first neighbor again and say, so. We may be in the wilderness together. But if you need something from God, I can still get a hold of it. Oh, his hand is not short. His arm is not weakened. Oh, I can get him in the wilderness. The next one that he planted was the fir or also known as the cypress tree. Mm, I learned a lot about trees, y'all. <laughs> the fir or the cypress tree. Now this is the one that I want to talk about. Because you see, I had to be reminded first that I must have firm roots and I must be steadfast. That's what the cedar tree taught me is that I have got to stand firm and resist decay. There was one thing I forgot to tell you. James chapter 4 and verse 5. James 4 and 5 I think it is. Submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I've got the ability to resist decay. That's what the cedar tree taught me. Then he planted the myrtle tree. I'm just giving you a quick rundown. The myrtle tree taught me that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever because it's a wax myrtle and it's everlasting. It's an evergreen. The third thing was the olive tree or the oil tree. That was to tell me that I don't only resist decay, I don't only, he's not only always the same, but I'm also still anointed. And now we are at the cypress tree. The cypress tree in Bible times was one of the main woods used as structural timber. Oh, now I'm getting ready to preach. It was the number one wood used that they would cut down and make beams for homes, for houses, for temples, for places of business. This was your building timber. And he says, now that I have reminded you that you must stand, be steadfast, and now that you understand that I never change, and now that you realize you are still anointed, just because you're in the wilderness does not mean you stop working. Get your building plans together. It's time to build. It's time to build. I want to be like Solomon and build God a place to dwell. I want to be like the, like the school of prophets when they told Elisha, 
this place is too small. I must build a bigger place because what we are expecting to take place is too big for this building. I'm not saying that we need a bigger building. I'm not saying that we need a bigger facility. What I am saying is we better get bigger plans and a bigger idea. Like a wise man once told me, your expectations are too small. I got to build. I got to build. I got to build. I got to build. I may be in the wilderness and I may be tired, but I am anointed and I've got to build. You know what that tells me? This is not your average anointing. This isn't your positional anointing. This is a Nehemiah anointing. An anointing that we have to build something. What are we trying to build? We're trying to build God a place. Build him a vessel so that he can pour out his spirit like never before. Come on, y'all ain't seen this, Justin. Oh, y'all don't know this man. Mm. The next one that he put was the pine tree. The pine tree is known for its sweet fruit. And reminds us we are fruitful in the wilderness. I had to look that up. I said, what sweet fruit? Huh? Pine cones have a seed in them. And if you get that seed out and eat it, it's sweet. But listen to me, it's not just sweet. It's also savory. Oh, I told y'all, y'all don't mess me up. I done got into science class over here. We're going to talk about truth. It's sweet and savory. Because if you are fruitful, that means you have the fruits of, oh, listen to me, the fruits of the Spirit. Can I say it? I always say it. I'm going to say it again. If you get mad, you don't like it, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. So what you can speak in tongues. Your tongue is so big you can wrap it around a Cadillac because all you want to do is gossip. You ain't got no fruit. Now that I said it, I'll move on. We must be fruitful in the wilderness. I do not care that you're in a bad place. That's what he's saying. He's saying it does not, it does not make me waver one bit that you're in a place that everyone says should irritate you and aggravate you. I still expect you to be fruitful. Oh, come on. I need to sit down with y'all. I'm going to preach to me. And y'all think I'm playing. So what they cut you off in traffic? So what destiny spent $20 you didn't have? I still expect you to be fruitful. I know this is the last episode of Blacklist. And the kids won't hush and the dog won't sit still. I still expect you to be fruitful. Oh, now let me preach to y'all. I don't care that the pastor made you mad. I don't care. He said you better get your gossip under control. Come on, somebody. I don't care that he looked you point blank in your face and said you're a liar. I don't care. I still expect you to be fruitful. <laughs> but it's also savory. And I'm reminded of the scripture where the Bible says... That we are to be the salt of the earth. Oh, I'm just going to move on. I got one more. Y'all want one more? This is my favorite one. The last one. The box tree. I looked up what in the world is a box tree. And it made me feel stupid. Because it said a tree that is in the shape of a box. 
I said, oh. I said, okay. Lord, help me be fruitful. Help me be fruitful. It's a box tree because it's in the shape of a box. But do you know what these box trees are used for? Number one purpose of a box tree. Anybody got a guess? What? They plant it in cities. Yep. And where the capitals are. Come on. You know why they? You know why they? You know why they plant them around the? You know why they plant them around those buildings? What do we call them? We don't call them box trees. We call them hedge. We call it a hedge bush. Oh, I hope they didn't have no hedge bushes at Volunteer Stadium last night. <laughs> I'm a Bama fan, but I hope they didn't have no hedge bushes. Because if they did, they're going to be like the hedge bushes out there at Jordan Hare Stadium. Trampled down to the ground. But they're hedge bushes. They're used to form a hedge. Yes. And it's a, what do they do the hedge for? It's more than just to be pretty. They do it as an extra layer of protection. Because you might can jump the gate. But this hedge bush has small pokey stems in it. And when you try to get through that hedge... It's going to poke you and scratch you and cut you and stop you from getting to what is on the other side. I always feel vulnerable in the wilderness. When I'm in the wilderness, I always seem to think that I am open and susceptible to anything that is in the wilderness. I'm susceptible to the wolves. And I'm susceptible and vulnerable to the lions. And I'm vulnerable to the snakes. And I'm vulnerable to the heat. And I'm vulnerable to everything that lives in the wilderness. But i got to tell somebody, you're not vulnerable in the wilderness. You've got a hedge of protection in the wilderness. i got a word. I hear you, Holy Ghost. This ain't in my, this ain't in my notes. i got to say this. If you're an intercessor, if you, if you operate in, in, in an intercessory anointing, I need you to stand to your feet right now. i got a word for you. Stand to your feet right now. If you intercede, what does that mean? Does God wake you up? You say, I don't know if I'm an intercessor. You wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning with somebody that you barely know on your mind and God says pray for them. Stand to your feet right now. Listen to me. The Bible, he was in the Bible, I believe it was Ezekiel, he asked him. He said, Ezekiel, who will make up the hedge? Who will make up the hedge, Ezekiel? I've planted the hedge tree, but there's a gap that I need somebody to stand in. I need to tell you intercessors, you thought I was going to bless you. No, I'm about to instruct you. If you wake up in the middle of the night to pray, you better pray because you are making up the hedge. If you don't pray, you're leaving them vulnerable. If you don't pray, you're leaving them, you're leaving them with a blind spot. You've got to make up the hedge. Do I got somebody in here that says I'll stretch out my head and make up the hedge? Oh, how do you make up the hedge? How do you make up the hedge? I can't find nobody oh, that'll make up the hedge. When I'm at my lowest point, I hope God wakes somebody up that's willing to make up the hedge. That'll pray for me when I can't pray for myself. That'll correct me when I don't see the truth for myself. That'll tell me what I need to know and not what I want to hear. Do I got anybody in here that says I'll make up the hedge? But let me tell you about a man. Y'all can sit down. Let me tell you about a man. Let me tell you about a man that made up the hedge for me. He said, I'm looking for somebody. 
that'll make up the hedge. Who will it be to make up the hedge? And a man named Jesus. Carried a cross. To a hill called Calvary. And I believe that when he stretched out his left hand. And he stretched out his right hand. He said I make up the hedge. I'll stand in the gap. And take on the wilderness for you. So when you find yourself in the wilderness, get some music on. Don't let the devil tell you that you cannot have revival. That you cannot have the glory in the wilderness. Because I've got everything I need right where I'm at. I've got everything I need right here, right now. Everybody stand on your feet all over the house. The devil has told you long enough that you're ineffective in the season you're in. Come on. The devil has lied to you long enough. But see, here's the thing about these trees. They only work if we use them. The trees are there. The cypress, the cedar, the myrtle, the box, the olive tree. They're all there. But we have to go and use what they produce. And constantly be reminded of the one that put them there. If you're in this house and you are, I don't want you to come up here and request nothing. Do you hear me? This isn't a prayer request time. If you're ready to make a statement to the enemy and say, I'm in the wilderness, but I will be effective right where I'm at. If you're ready to make that statement, I want to agree with you on it. I want to ask that you begin to come right now. Hey guys, I hope today's message has really encouraged you and has built your faith because our Bibles tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And today, I believe that House of the Promise has planted that seed inside of you, the seed of faith. And I just want to take a moment at the end of this message today and pray with you that whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that you've got going on in your life, God is going to do everything. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray right now and we ask that every situation and every circumstance, for anyone that may be listening today, God, God, I pray that you would intervene in a mighty way like only you can, God. Your word says that you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ever ask or thank God. So God, I just pray right now that healing would be loose in their lives. Salvation would be loose in their lives. And your delivering power would be loose in their lives, God. God, we thank you and we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that you got something out of that. I hope that God has spoken to your life today. I believe he has spoken to my life. And I believe that he is speaking into yours. So come back and be with us next time. Subscribe to the channel so that you never miss a word. And be blessed.